By now, some of you might have heard of these neurotrophin receptors, like the TRAC-B receptor, a key regulator of neuronal plasticity. Now, in the past, I've looked at some studies suggesting, for example, that drugs like ketamine or psilocybin may promote plasticity by acting on or through TRAC-B receptors. But what if I were to tell you that these receptors can also be activated by temperature? And that's exactly what we're going to look at today. So stay tuned. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala. I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. Today I have a special treat for you. It's special because it's a paper that I have been working on for quite some time now. It's also my first so-called last author paper. So it's, it's special. To be honest, some of the results of this paper are also quite shocking, and that's why I wanted to share it with you, even though it's perhaps not the most typical content that I would be producing on, on this channel. But I think it has scientific relevance. Now, some of the results are truly shocking, uh, and we'll discuss those. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about the background and introduction into this uh, story. So the first thing you really need to know is that there is a lot of research on both classical or traditional antidepressants and the more recent uh, rapid acting treatments of depression, suggesting that these drugs essentially are able to promote brain plasticity, at least in uh, the rodent brain. A key molecular mechanism thought to underlie these effects is associated with the activation of TRAC-B receptors, which act as the cognate receptor for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. BDNF is a member of the neurotrophin family of growth factors, which have neurotrophic effects in the nervous system. This role is particularly important during development of the nervous system, since mice born without BDNF have defects in brain and sensory nervous system and die soon after birth. In general, by binding to TRAC-B receptors, BDNF is thought to support the survival of neurons and to encourage growth and differentiation of new neurons and synapses. BDNF is also important for processes like memory formation and is involved in neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons in some parts of the adult brain. The study of BDNF and its receptor track B has been a key area of research in relation to antidepressant drugs for a few decades now. And it has also been a focus of my own research since I started to pursue my doctoral studies several years ago. Interestingly, pharmacologically diverse antidepressant drugs, including tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, SSRIs like fluoxetine, and rapid-acting antidepressants like ketamine, have all been suggested to converge in their ability to activate TRAC-B receptors and its downstream signaling cascades. Many mechanisms have been proposed to explain how this happens. On one hand, chronic administration of classical antidepressants increases BDNF expression in several brain areas, which may then bind to track B receptors to mediate further effects. On the other hand, drugs like ketamine have been suggested to induce a rapid BDNF translation and release, which could perhaps underlie some of their rapid effects. Then again, some studies suggest that drugs like amitriptyline act as direct agonists of track B receptors, and I've actually recently made a video about the paper suggesting that ketamine and psychedelics also directly bind to the transmembrane domain of track B, facilitating its activation by endogenous BDNF. Altogether, the literature uh, remains somewhat unclear and mixed with regards to the precise mechanism of uh, how these drugs ultimately activate TRAC-B signaling in the brain. 
And the study I'm going to talk about today makes the interpretation of the literature even a little bit more difficult. But before we get started, I just want to say that this paper is a little bit of a data dump consisting of you know, exploratory experiments collected uh, over many years and then put together in a seemingly uh, coherent way. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been done with whatever little resources we've had along the years. So, so keep that in mind. But what I can also say is that the main findings are truly rock solid and have been replicated time and time again in the lab. So I can, I can tr truly stand behind this data. So the paper in question is called Linking Hypothermia and Altered Metabolism with Track B Activation, published in ACS Chemical Neuroscience, and it presents some intriguing findings of how Track B receptors may be regulated by temperature. The paper begins with figure one, where we show the screening of various drugs classified as stimulants, antidepressants, sedatives, antipsychotics, and anesthetics on track B receptor phosphorylation at the tyrosine 816 residue. Phosphorylation is a molecular mechanism that involves the addition of a phosphate group to a protein, which in turn modifies its function. The Y816 residue is one of the commonly investigated phosphorylation sites on track B receptors, which indicates to some extent its activation. For example, when BDNF binds to the track B receptor, the receptor undergoes dimerization and several sites become phosphorylated, including the Y816. This phosphorylation then recruits further signaling partners and leads to the activation of downstream signaling cascades. But let's not get too deep into all of that. The main point of figure one is to demonstrate that the sedative properties of a drug at least at the used dose, seem to coincide with the phosphorylation of track B receptors in the mouse brain, whereas stimulant drugs like amphetamine and atipamazole seem to do very little. In graph B, you can see how clozapine and amitriptyline both decrease locomotor activity, while atipamazole has very little effect and amphetamine unexpectedly stimulates locomotor activity. Okay, so so far sedation seems to kind of correlate with, you know, track B signaling. I mean, it's, it's just a correlation. Let's see. Figure 2 is, again, somewhat of a data dump, but let's focus on some of the key findings. In graph A, you can see that isoflurane anesthesia again upregulates track B signaling and some of the associated pathways. And a similar pattern is also observed 60 minutes after a fluorotil induced seizure. Fluorotil is very similar to isoflurane in its structure, but instead of producing anesthesia, it actually produces the opposite, excitation and ultimately seizures. Interestingly, fluorotil has been used as a chemical convulsion therapy for treating major depression since it achieves somewhat similar results to electroconvulsive therapy where the seizure is triggered by electricity. Seizures are followed by what's called the post-ictal period when electroencephalography or EEG typically shows increased slow wave activity and the animals and you know, also humans, often display behavioral sedation, which is again somewhat similar to what you know, anesthetics do, at least at small doses. On the right, graph C demonstrates that the injection of ATP, or adenosine trisphosphate, also triggers a state characterized by general EEG suppression and increased low EEG activity, accompanied again by track B phosphorylation. Again, graph D, demonstrates that a combination of two metabolic inhibitors, 2-deoxyglucose and mercaptoacetate, trigger robust track B phosphorylation during a state of behavioral sedation. Again, these results further suggest that sedation and perhaps, you know, altered energy metabolism seems to coincide with the activation of track B in the brain. Going forward to figure 3, we investigated whether physiological deep sleep is sufficient to activate track B receptors. This was achieved by sleep depriving the mice for 6 hours, which makes them really sleepy, and then either allowing to go to recovery sleep or not before the samples were collected. After sleep deprivation, both humans and rodents generally fall asleep very fast, 
go into deep sleep and display an increase in slow EEG power. And it seems that again during this deep sleep, track B receptors become phosphorylated. One obvious question is whether the slow EEG activity itself is driving track B activation, as we've been uh, investigating in some of our previous studies. For example, in one study we looked at the dose-dependent effects of ketamine in mice, and it seemed that the higher doses of ketamine truly seemed to uh, increase uh, slow EEG activity while also increasing track B activation. Now in graph B here, we administered atropine, which produces pronounced cortical slow wave activity, but it failed to increase track B phosphorylation. Moreover, in graph C, we administered metatomidine, which again produces deep sedation characterized by slow EEG activity and pronounced track B activation. When we pretreated mice with amphetamine, the increase in EEG delta power was mostly abolished, but it appears there is still some trend of increased track B phosphorylation present. Here, we also monitored core body temperature, which shows that amphetamine pretreatment does not fully block the metatominine induced drop in body temperature. Since we know, and, and we show actually in uh, the supplementary figure as sex, that anesthetics, metabolic inhibitors, you know, even seizures seem to uh, decrease um, uh, the mouse body temperature, could it be that hypothermia is what is actually driving track B receptor signaling in the brain? In figure 4, we demonstrate that the administration of amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant, produces a pronounced temperature drop. However, by maintaining the mice in a warm incubator, this drop can be mostly prevented. And when it is prevented, it seems like the increase in track B phosphorylation is also prevented. So essentially, what we are seeing is that no matter the treatment, whether it's anesthetics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, or even deep sleep, whenever core body temperature decreases, track B phosphorylation increases. Does this mean that all of these treatments are plasticity promoting or that they have antidepressant effects? Absolutely not. At this stage, we know nothing about what's going on in terms of the functional significance of these events. And again, while this paper is far from perfect, I can say that this hypothermia-induced uh, track B phosphorylation has been replicated over and over again in the lab, and I can, I can say that I'm 100% behind this data, and I'm sure it will replicate in other labs as well. What is actually quite shocking to me is that drugs like fluoxetine have been commonly given at high doses in preclinical research, but nobody has really paid uh, any attention to the effects of these drugs on body temperature, since even small changes in temperature seem to regulate track B signaling, a lot of the literature from the past decade or so may have been reporting effects on, on track B and other pathways as well that are being caused by hypothermia instead of a specific drug effect. And you know that includes my own studies. Uh, the body temperature of rodents can also be influenced by you know ambient housing temperature, group sizes, circadian time, stress, and many, many other factors which are unfortunately often neglected in research. So there is a lot of work to be done to really address the extent of this phenomenon as a confounding factor in molecular studies. Finally, again, I want to emphasize that there is no known you know, biological function for any of these observations as of now, but we can always speculate that they might play a you know, a neurobiological role. And if that function translates to the human brain, you know, now we're getting into interesting territory. And I better get back to doing the actual research to continue figuring this stuff out. You know, I just wish I had the funding, but maybe I'll get lucky. Who knows? Now, please leave your comments, your thoughts down below. What do you think about this uh, mechanism of temperature uh, regulated track B activation and what could be its potential implications. 
Also, feel free to comment any of my other videos. I regularly try to review the comments and try to answer as, as many of them as possible. And of course, please remember to like and subscribe to my channel for future content. But you know, that's all for today, so until next time.